All right, everyone, thank you for your patience. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Nick Scala, and I will be your presenter today for uh, the evolution of imminent danger orders and application by MSHA and legal developments. Uh, so thank you as we sorted out a couple technical issues right there to start off, but uh, as we have now got those um, fixed, we'll get going and move forward. So today we are going to talk about 107A imminent danger orders. Um, and before we get into that, uh, a bit of a background is uh, on me. Is my name is Nick Scala. I am the chair of the Amsha Practice Group at Con Sale Carry LLP, um, and I do Amsha defense work for operators and independent contractors all around the country. And part of that includes uh, managing investigations that stem from imminent danger orders, and that include imminent danger orders. And these are really an area that we have seen a bit of change in how MSHA has moved forward uh, in the last few years in addressing them and using them. And this uh, ties back into as well some decisions that come down from the Federal Mine Safety Health and Health Review Commission and its administrative law judges, uh, which has really somewhat changed how we look at or how the courts look at the validity of an imminent danger order. Uh, so as we get into that today, uh, it's obviously you know, important to understand what we're talking about uh, before we get into the specifics of how MSHA is using them, what the courts are saying about them, and then also we'll fi finish up with how do we contest these because they are contestable. And, you know, first that's going to start with looking at how do we define them or how does MSHA define them and how are these implemented by the agency. Um, now, imminent danger orders aren't issued with the frequency of a 104A or even a 104D, but they are being seen more often. Um, so, you know, it's important to understand this enforcement tool that MSHA has and how the agency can use it against mine operators. So when we're looking at what an imminent danger order is, uh, you know, we look at what does the Mine Act say? Well, how does the Mine Act define it? And the Mine Act defines it by that section in orange up there, that any can, the existence of a condition or practice which could reasonably be expected to cause death or serious physical harm before such condition or practice can be abated. Um, so, you know, when we are looking at these, the name itself gives us some idea of the definition, imminent danger, uh, something that should be posing a serious or fatal danger to individuals, to minors, immediately, imminently. We also look at, you know, that can be reasonably expected to cause death or serious harm. Uh, so what does this mean when we are told you being issued an imminent danger order? Well, it's an immediate withdrawal, okay, just as an un an unwarrantable failure order is a withdrawal for that area, for that equipment, or for that activity. The imminent danger is an immediate removal from service for that piece of equipment, or if it's cited for a high wall, for that high wall. Uh, whatever it may be, work stops at that point in time until MSHA can determine that the danger has been removed. Uh, <clears throat> Now, there is still obviously going to be provisions and opportunities for us to go in and abate it. And, you know, that has to be permitted in order for us to terminate the imminent danger order. But at its initiation, when it begins, this will most likely be a carte blanche cease work for an entire area or for an entire piece of equipment or practice. And then once it is determined what that fix is going to be, we'll be able to go in and begin making those changes or making that abatement effort. So <clears throat> it does have the ability to shut down a area or even multiple pieces of our equipment, which is a serious concern. You know, we're going to want to make sure that we understand what these imminent danger orders are and what specifically is being attacked. Um, because, you know, this can obviously have the power to shut down a significant portion of our operations or maybe some key elements of our operations. When we look at it, though, we often hear, and you'll most likely hear from an inspector, uh, if you challenge them on a imminent danger, that it is something that has a reasonable potential to cause death or serious injury 
to a miner if normal mining operations were permitted to proceed. So, you know, that brings up a question, and this is something that the courts have added to that definition we saw on the last slide. And, you know, it, it is important because what it tells us is that, you know, while the danger may not be immediate, and, you know, we'll use the example of a case that uh, we'll discuss li later on, but in that case we had a piece of equipment that MSHA felt the brakes were effective and this posed an imminent danger. And it was saying, you know, it was argued that given normal mining operations, someone eventually would be put in serious imminent danger as a result of this because it was operating with defective brakes. But the question also comes back to, at this point, what are normal mining operations? What are our company policies and procedures regarding the identification of a defect or a hazard and then removal from service or correction of that hazard? Um, it also brings into question elements of whether or not the area has been worked in or that piece of equipment has been worked in, how long or how long since it has been worked and if we're talking about a specific area that maybe is inactive. Um, you know, and this is an important element of why we want to, you know, distinguish and delineate between active and inactive areas of the R operation as well as, uh, you know, providing barricades and signage to identify areas that may be inactive, you know, which would prevent MSHA from going back into them if they're abandoned. Uh, you know, those areas are not to be inspected and as well, you know, if there is a question about its activity, having a berm up, you know, to separate that from normal areas is obviously a very good step in identifying or demonstrating that this area is not actively being mined at that time. <clears throat> so, you know, the question of what are normal mining operations, well, MSHA uses that, the inspectors use that as a tool to, you know, broaden the scope of what might be imminent. Um, it's also something that as an operator, we need to look at critically and determine if we are going to challenge this order, you know, how are we going to prove that there was not imminence, that this hazard was not going to imminently or reasonably cause death or serious injury, which in a short temporal um, time or a short period of time after it is issued or after it's observed and normal mining operations are going to be part of that. It's also important to identify if normal mining operations and training subject to those might be to remove things from service or to test our brakes when we enter a certain area. Um, you know, when MSHA comes through here, they have to prove later on that this citation or this order was issued in order to prevent something very serious from happening in a short amount of time or that was going to happen in a short amount of time. And, you know, this is one area where normal mining operations is a question of what does that necessarily mean? Because MSHA is going to say, well, normal mining operations mean you're going to keep operating with this defect or this hazard present uh, and do nothing to correct it. And I think that's an important element that we need to consider as operators when we look at these critically, when we determine if we're going to contest them, if we're going, and if so, if how we're going to contest them. Another question that we see <clears throat> is, can these be issued after um, an accident has happened? And can they be issued without MSHA observing at the condition or without them being physically present to observe the condition and you know the answers differ because yes they MSHA can issue an imminent danger order by phone without being on site and this can be as a result of a photo that was sent to them or as a result of a phone call or a verbal hazard complaint in which a certain condition is described to them uh, and that is you know, that's an important element because these are can these orders are always issued verbally or should always be issued verbally before they're reduced to writing. And that verbal uh, initial step in this is because 
when we get an imminent danger or when we get an 107A or when an inspector determines that one is appropriate, it's because they're observing something in the moment or becoming aware of something in the moment that, again, is so imminently going to result in death or serious injury. And they must act immediately in order to withdraw that area from service. And so that verbal element is going to be present. And it's also, you know, why we need to make sure that when we are working with an investigator or an inspector and they're on site, we need to have that communication with them because we need to have the ability to understand that what they are just saying and what they are issuing, although it's not a physical citation at this time or order at this time, still is enforceable. And, you know, just because we don't agree with it doesn't mean that that verbal imminent danger order is not enforceable and that we cannot be further enforced against for working in the face of it. So when, you know, this is especially something that is going to be you know, come up when we are issued these by phone. And that is ha that has happened. I've come across, you know, many circumstances when an operator will call and say, you know, I just got a phone call from MSHA saying they received a photo of something one of our people were do was doing, and we have been issued this imminent danger order, and they set us inspectors on their way over. Uh, and in that situation, you still have to remove that area from service. You still have to remove that equipment or that task. Uh, from service, and you will be given, if it's deemed that this was an appropriate use of a verbal imminent danger, or you will be given that written order at a later date. Now, at the same time, there is the beginning part of what I have up on that slide, which can this be issued after an accident has already occurred? And the answer is no. An imminent danger order cannot be issued for something that's already occurred unless the condition still exists and still poses a danger to minors. Um, and we need to keep that in mind because, you know, if the imminent danger order isn't issued, even if verbally at the time that the danger existed, uh, you know, and say, for example, it's someone working from heights without fall protection, if it is not issued while that person is exposed to that danger, it cannot be issued any longer. So if that person is up there and MSHA doesn't issue an imminent danger and the person comes down from that and MSHA hears later that they were standing out over that ledge, that most certainly can be the basis of a citation. It might even be a basis of an unavoidable failure, but that does not satisfy or support the requirements needed to issue an imminent danger order, meaning a withdrawal of that area. Now, that is an important element when we look at this because these are not meant to be a control tool, okay? Uh, a, if there is not an imminent danger at that point in time, MSHA cannot issue them just to lock down an area, much like the 103K and J orders that are issued in the event of an accident or an injury or a fatality, you know, those are meant to control the area and protect persons from hazards. They are not meant just to preserve the site for evidence. Um, similarly, imminent danger orders are to prevent the exposure of individuals to a seriously dangerous situation, and they are not meant just to be able to be issued post hoc uh, in an attempt to remove a certain area from service. So we got to, we want to keep that in mind because this is a common area where maybe there's going to be overstep or there could be overstep. The condition has to be in existence when the imminent danger is issued. And so again, that can be by phone, um, that can be verbally, uh, and then you will be offered the order in writing. but it has to be for something that existed at the time that MSHA issued it. And, you know, it is, it's an important part of it. We don't want to let this be something that is issued after we've performed some abatement or after we've removed air persons from an area. Uh, so, you know, those admissions or those acknowledgements of a hazard being present and someone being exposed to it, if that is how 
the course of conversation or the course of the investigation goes, most certainly that could be the basis for an unwarrantable failure, 104D, but that should not serve as a basis for a 107A. So as we've just discussed, these are going to be first issued in verbally and then reduced to written order. And that's supposed to happen as soon as practical by MSHA. That's what they have documented as their procedure. So it may be in a day or maybe later that same day, uh, or it might be in the next hour. It depends. Um, but it also, though, these citations or these orders, they're not accessible. So when we are looking at receiving a 107A, and we are looking at contesting them later on, which we'll discuss at the end of the presentation, we're not going to get a penalty assessment for these. Now, that, that's very good. Obviously, we don't want to receive any additional penalties um, from MSHA, but at the same time, we don't, that means we can't sit on our rights to contest. We have to take steps to contest an imminent danger order within the first 30 days since its issuance. Uh, we don't get the opportunity to wait for a citation to come out um, that has a penalty assessed that we get in the mail on our proposed assessment and statement accounts, and then have 30 days to contest it or pay it from that point with MSHA. Within the first 30 days of issuance, we have to contest this imminent danger. And while there are opportunities to file a, you know, a motion for to reopen the 107A for contest, which it is actually just a motion, a request for an extension uh, to contest the 107A. These take months to year uh, or more to get through the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission because any motion to reopen, any request to contest a final order has to go through them. So, you know, it's important, even though we're not going to get a penalty for this, we have the right to contest it. And if we do want to contest it, we need to take action or take affirmative steps to do that soon after the issuance occurs, so within those 30 days. Now, just because we aren't going to get a penalty for that 107A does not mean that there aren't going to be any penalties from this occurrence. When we get a 107A, there will be a companion or an associated enforcement action, and by that I mean a 104A or 104D. And this will be issued, and it can be more than one, uh, but it's typically a, at least one citation or order that's issued referring back to the condition cited in the imminent danger. And when that is the case, you know, we will be receiving a penalty for that. And, you know, we will be able to challenge that when we get that proposed assessment. But as I said before, that is not the 107A. So challenging that underlying or that associated enforcement action does not contest the 107A as well. Even though on the pr proposed assessment, it will say you know, 104A slash 107A because they're tied together. They reference one another, but you do not contest both of them. So again, from a contest pr perspective, we need to keep in mind that we cannot contest the same a 107A the same way as a 104A, and we have the right to contest it. And if there is something associated with it, which there will be, that has a penalty assessed, you will get that through the normal routes, and you will have the normal opportunities to contest that 104A or 104D at that time. Also, when we're looking at this, those citations, those actual enforcement actions, that are going to have a penalty assessed with them, the fact that they are based upon an imminent danger means that they are going to be eligible for special assessments. Um, and what special assessments mean is that MSHA has a normal way of calculating a penalty, which is in uh, Part 100.3 of the CFR, 30 CFR. And Part of that is they have a penalty point screen, and we don't need to get into all that, but what it essentially bears down to is the designations of a citation, whether it's reasonably likely or 
it is high negligence or low negligence, there's point values associated with all of those. And then when MSHA gets a citation, they add up all the points for those designations, all the points from your, your enforcement history or the size of your operation, the hours you've worked, and they add them all up. And they have a chart back there in 100.3 that says if you have 60 points or below, you're at the statutory minimum of $130 for your penalty. If you're at 140 points or higher, you're at the maximum of 69,000 and change for your penalty. What special assessments mean is they're no longer barred or they're no longer required to follow that penalty chart. So if they have a citation that might be $500, they can assess it at 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 if they want because it in that's based on a determination of you know, what was the negligence, how serious was this, how obvious was it. They're going to take it back and review it for a number of these circumstances. And the 107A, the fact that it was issued in relation to that is going to play heavily into it. And it also, as I said, makes it automatically eligible for special assessments and reviewed for appropriateness of special assessments, meaning should this be one we send up there for special assessments. And you know, so this is something that while there isn't a penalty associated with that 107A, as we've discussed, it does have a direct impact on the type of penalty you, the, the company can receive for that. Uh, in addition to what the penalty can uh, receive, I'm sorry, the penalty the company can receive, 107As can also be the basis for agent liability investigations or 110 or special assessment investigations, whatever you you know, know them by, uh, but these Section 110 investigations are special investigations by MSHA into the negligence and liability of agents of management. And this part down here on the bottom, this types up um, image, is from MSHA's Special Investigation Handbook. And you can see right there that each 104A citation that contributed to the issuance of an imminent danger order for a withdrawal is going to be considered for an agent and liability case. Uh, so, you know, when we look at that, there are a lot of enforcement options that this opens the door for. Um, and again, if we're looking at very obvious risks, very obvious hazards, or what MSHA determines are very obvious uh, and very severe, we can also be seeing unwarrantable failures come down from these. So. The 107A, while not a <clears throat> common item and not carrying a penalty itself, it does open the door for a lot of enforcement by MSHA and a lot of teeth that MSHA has. Uh, and this is in addition, obviously, of it being able to shut down part of our operation until it's abated to the agency's uh, liking. So what are some common areas that we see 107A is issued for. And, you know, obviously this list is not exhaustive. Um, it's not a complete list of what we can get in 107A for, but these are some of the areas that we commonly see them, or maybe it's more accurate to say some of the most common causes of 107A can be looked back to these reasons. Um, and that, you know, a big one, and when I say a big one, I mean a very very prevalent cause of 107As is working from heights without fall protection. And this probably seems, you know, very straightforward. You know, that is obviously something that can lead to a serious citation, whether it's working without the fall protection or having unsafe access. Um, you know, we're going to want to be able to follow those, but these are also one of the most likely reasons that we can get a 107A. On top of that, there's also unsafe ground conditions. And that can, you know, that can open up a lot of different conditions to question whether that is high wall conditions or if you're in an underground mine. Uh, it can be the conditions of the roof and the pillars. Uh, or if there's any material that needs scaling, it can be in dump areas. We've, you know, unfortunately seen a couple uh, serious injuries this year um, from the 
lack of berming or an alleged lack of berming in certain areas of mines. Uh, so berming is one that we can look to inspect us. Um, also, as we talked about earlier, breaks on mobile equipment, especially uh, equipment used in the haulage of material. This is a very, very common cause, and that is also because powered haulage has for a number of years been MSHA's uh, one of, if not the most common cause of fatal incidents and serious, as in, serious injuries. So defective parking brake or brakes on equipment, um, and that is service brakes typically, or it can be parking brakes and emergency brakes, are an area that are ripe for a 107A action. Um, atmospheric conditions in underground mines, and also working in, or on, around, under suspended loads. Um, these are all conditions that we you know, frequently see imminent danger orders issued for, and as I said before, there are those you know, follow-up citations and orders that you have to deal with. Um, but you know, again, we're looking at we're looking at situations that need to be reasonably likely to cause death or serious injury to a minor. So, you know, again, this is an area where we want to keep our own observations open because you know, oftentimes once an inspector decides that they're going to issue this, you know, you may not be able to talk them out of it unless you have some very good reasons and just see something that they don't see, such as a person actually wearing fall protection when they think they're not. But, <clears throat> you know, we want to be observant to the surroundings and the conditions so that we can make note of those later on. Uh, we want to be able to come back and, you know, look at that with our perspective and what happened. And, <clears throat> you know, this is often, or more so the case than ever, because Inspectors have been much more liberal with the issuance of the 107As in the last few years. And, you know, this really started um, a few years ago when there was a spike in the metal, non-metal industry uh, fatalities. And at that time, um, Assistant Secretary of MSHA, Joe Main, got on a conference call with all industry stakeholders who wanted to call in. And he said that we will encourage our inspectors to issue them in danger orders if they see a condition that they think could cause death or serious injury. And at that time, you also saw MSHA dig in quite a bit more on their evaluation of or their willingness to modify or vacate imminent danger orders because they do have you know, and even if an inspector says, oh, I gave you the verbal and now we can't, we can't change it. I already put that into motion. That's not true. They can withdraw the issuance or vacate the issuance of an imminent danger order. Um, and, you know, you need to look at, and when you're doing your own evaluation, you need to look at how imminent is that. Um, and is it going to be reasonably expected to cause death or serious physical harm? You know, this is not unlike the evaluation that we have to do for an SNS designation. You know, is it reasonably likely to cause a reasonably serious injury? And, you know, in this case, though, it is death or serious injury, um, and is it imminently going to happen before it can be abated? So, you know, that that is the questions that we have to look at. And, you know, when we see that, that definition of imminence has been an area where MSHA has taken a little bit of leeway in how they're letting their in inspectors enforce it. You know, can the inspectors anticipate that imminence or normal mining operations include, you know, mining for the next hour or the next day or the next week? or does it have to be immediately? Uh, now, I think the definition is pretty clear, imminent. Um, that is a very strong word demonstrating that it needs to be something that's going to happen very soon. Uh, but the inspectors have been given the latitude to anticipate 
what may happen given continued mining operations. So maybe not this next trip down the hall road, but maybe it's five trips down the hall road. Um, so again, these gray areas, we need to look at how serious it is, what do we think the facts and circumstances surrounding it are, uh, and should we, you know, push back at that time, or should we, you know, just rope off the area and move on? Now, I mean, remember, this is an imminent danger situation, so don't let MSHA inspectors just issue it and walk away. Don't let them point something and say, that's an imminent danger, and then just keep walking and, and not look back and not think about it again, because clearly if they are that uh, relaxed about it or that not concerned about it, it, it isn't that much of an imminent danger. And we want to make note of that too. We want to make note of how the inspector is treating the condition. Um, if you know the inspector is truly seeing a condition that they think is imminently likely to cause death or serious physical harm before it's abated, you know, they should be staying in that area and they should be monitoring it until it's abated, until, until it's removed or barricaded to prevent access. So, you know, that is a fact that the courts have uh, somewhat looked to when they're evaluating how serious maybe this imminent danger was. Um, and you want to make sure that you hold the MSHA inspector accountable for that, or you make note of the fact that they just walked away as soon as they saw it and didn't check to see what was done or who did it or how we addressed their concern. Uh, we uh, we have a question, and you know now is uh, as good of a place as any to address it. And if anyone else has any, please venture on. But uh, the question is: Does the danger have to reasonably related to some provision of Part 46 or Part 48, for that matter, or is it wide open to the inspector's discretion? And uh, the answer to that is no. It's not just related to training issues. Um, training issues: If you have a a danger related to Part 46 or Part 48, we're most likely going to receive a 104G order, uh, which is a training withdrawal order for the miners, uh, minor or minors subject to the training deficiency. Imminent danger orders, while not issued under a specific standard, typically relate to safety and health conditions around the mine. Um, the G order is used for the training um, withdrawals. So, you know, when we're looking at a 107A, it's most likely going to be related to that underlying citation for a, you know, whether it's brakes or it's high wall conditions or it's fall protection. Um, the, the 104G order being a withdrawal of its own um, takes care of the training provisions under Part 46 and 48. So now that we have one, if we do get a 107A and it's been issued, we know that we're shut down for that area or if it's a piece of equipment, that equipment shut down until we are terminated or until the order is terminated by MSHA. So what do we want to know in this situation? Let's be sure we are abundantly clear as to what is exactly withdrawn from service or what area is withdrawn from service. We don't want to let the inspector shut down an entire high wall if it's only a five or 10 foot section that's removed from the actual mining area. That can be barricaded off, that can be bermed off and uh, continued mining operations ongoing in the other areas where exposure isn't present. If it's a specific piece of equipment, it obviously that piece of equipment is withdrawn from service. So if there's any confusion or any questions regarding what exactly are we looking at here, again, you need to bring that up at, at that moment with AMSHA because we don't want to have any confusion and go forward and make a number of changes and then there aren't, those aren't what we were supposed to do, or that area wasn't the question, area in question, or that condition in MSHA's eyes still exists given our abatement because we didn't address a specific item. So 
know what we're supposed to do. Also, don't work in the face of the order until it's granted by MSHA. Now, we typically in imminent danger order, you get told what specifically needs to be done. And we know now if that's not the case, we need to ask. And then we are allowed and permitted to put people into place to correct that. Now, that doesn't mean putting them in danger. So if this is actually a condition that is creating a hazard for minors, we'll have to figure out a way to do so safely, uh, to bait the condition safely. But, you know, we also can't be held hostage by the order and MSHA not permitting us to conduct abatement for an extended period of time. It has to be, you know, something or a period of time that you know, we determine a plan to address the issue or we determine a fix for the issue and maybe MSHA will make us wait until we have determined a safe way to abate the condition, but they cannot just give you a carte blanche, no, no access. You cannot do anything for abatement. You have to be permitted to abate the condition, uh, but to do so in a manner that does not put anyone at risk. And then lastly, uh, the question is, you know, Say we have an imminent danger order and MSHA is gone for a day. Now, you know, typically we these are observed um, and the abatement is observed before MSHA leaves. Um, if it is a more widespread issue, such as ground conditions, you know, MSHA might tell you what needs to be done or tell you what the hazard they believe is present and you know, they don't have to come on site to terminate these or to modify a withdrawal order. And that applies to a 107A. So if MSHA decides to issue a 107A and then disappears for a day or two days, you know, you can call into the field office, you can call into the district office or get in touch with your inspector and describe the abatement after it's taken, provide photographs, uh, provide, you know, proof that we no longer have the same condition present, and they can terminate that without being on site. Now, you might not get the documentation uh, for a couple days, but they can provide that termination. I've had inspectors provide termination of withdrawal orders by voicemail or by email um, or just through a phone call. So that is an option, and you know, know that MSHA doesn't always have to come back out on site, um, and there has to be a reasonableness factor in how long they can withdraw an area if you've taken the action to correct it. So don't sit back and just let them make you wait and wait and wait. You can be proactive in reaching out and telling them what has been corrected and demonstrating that you've abated a condition if the 107A has not been abated before they leave. All right, so a couple relevant cases that have given these a bit more uh, standing um, is, you know, the first one is a Warrior Coal case. Now, this was a citation issued back in 2011. Um, the decision just came out in the last year or so, and it was deci decided by the Cir Court of Appeals, the 11th Circuit. And the question came down to, and this is, you know, could MSHA or did MSHA appropriately issue a 107A for elevated methane readings in the roof cavity of a mine, and this was a coal mine. And, you know, this condition was discovered by MSHA. Um, the company quickly fixed it by moving a couple barriers around for the airflow. Um, and, you know, the company argued that this wasn't an area where there was um, a likelihood of an explosion. There was no imminence because there was no ignition source in the area. Um, there was not a miners near this specific area, although they were nearby. Um, and in the case, MSHA kept holding on to the, that they weren't going to vacate the 107A because the inspector did not abuse his discretion in issuing it. And when we're looking at that, we're looking at you know, abuse of discretion is, you know, did a failure to exercise sound, reasonable decision making given the information known or observed at the time of the issuance? And what this means is that MSHA's position in supporting the inspectors here is if it was reasonable that 
this could have resulted or the inspector could have thought it would result in a death or serious injury, they can issue a 107A. And, you know, that, that gets away from some of the previous cases and our, you know, the previous industry understanding that there has to be some some basis to us. Now MSHA just wants to say, well, the end inspector could reasonably determine or reasonably deduce that a death or a serious injury could happen, again, given normal mining operations are continued, they can issue a 107A, and that 107A is valid. And, you know, MSHA's taken the position that, oh, what's the matter if you have a 107A on your record, there's no penalty to it. Well, for contractors, those can be huge qualification red flags. For, you know, publicly traded companies, these are an immediately reportable incident under um, the Dodd-Frank Act. And for, you know, all companies, it is just a an imminent danger on your record. And, you know, especially if we don't agree that it is valid or that an imminent danger existed, why would we want to sit back and accept this? If we get pulled over for speeding, but in court we determine or provide the judge with evidence that we weren't speeding, you know, that ticket should be thrown out. Well, and, you know, that is one of the issues that, you know, industry has with this recent change of uh, enforcement or maybe change of support of imminent danger orders is MSHA saying, well, we don't want to discourage our inspectors from issuing these when they think that death or serious injury could happen or when an imminent danger is present, that even after you prove to us that it wasn't present, we're not going to vacate them. And, and that's a very frustrating position to be in um, as an operator. Another case that we talked about previously with the mobile equipment, uh, you know, again, that was issued in a case that the uh, it was determined by a judge that the citation, the associated citation, should not even be SNS. So it was modified to unlikely non-SNS citation. Uh, but they did not vacate the 107A because it was based off of the, or because they determined that the inspector did not abuse their discretion in issuing it. So here we have a condition cited as unlikely to result in an injury, but an imminent danger order associated with it upheld. And, you know, Previous cases, uh, some of the seminal cases prior to these, you know, had language in them to the extent that an inspector must make a reasonable investigation into the facts and circumstances to make his determination upon the facts and circumstances known and reasonably available to him at that time. And, you know, another one back in um, the early 90s, Island Creek Coal, uh, a 107A was vacated because the court determined that it was based on the inspector's speculative anticipation. So the courts have kind of given and supported MSHA in this abuse of discretion standard, meaning that you know they are going, they are saying, oh yeah, you can go ahead and issue these because you thought something was going to happen at that time, even if upon further review of the circumstances we determine it wasn't going to happen or it was unlikely to happen. So, you know, when we look at that, you know, it comes back to how do we defend these in the moment and how do we set the table to be successful with an imminent danger? Well, we want to look at it or, and if we want to contest it, and that's what I mean, when we're evaluating it, um, we got to look at the reasonableness of the issuance. And that's going to be observing the conditions around us. And that's what I said. I also, you know, what particular facts and circumstances determine that this wasn't an imminent danger? And it's important to make those known to MSHA as soon as possible. Now, I'm not saying immediately start arguing after it's verbally issued, because you have a duty just to prevent access to that area. But you can have a discussion with MSHA about this not being an imminent danger based on those facts and circumstances. You also want to look at, as we talked about before, what it constitutes normal mining operations and how much of a exposure risk is there actually to this condition. Um, and just remember always, if we are preparing to contest something, MSHA will record all the events. Obviously, all the inspectors 
sit with their notepads as you go through an inspection, document everything. And that is a good practice that we should also be doing so we have our contemporaneous recollection as well. And this is especially true in a situation where an imminent danger comes into play. Now, you know, we obviously don't want to put anything in there that is going to, you know, possibly hurt us in terms of acknowledging, you know, we put someone in that position or we instructed someone to act in that way. You know, we don't want to put those kind of dam but damning elements into writing, obviously, but we want to look at it. What facts and circumstances make this not an imminent danger? And we need to evaluate those and we need to be able to put those into writing so that we have that contemporaneous recollection to go against MSHA as we're at that point in time. You know, if we're going to be litigating one of these, obviously we know now that the inspectors are given a great deal of latitude. And if you get to the point where you're taking them to a hearing, you're going to have to fight this abuse of discretion case law. And, you know, when we look at that, again, the question should rest on the facts and circumstances observed by the inspector. Was it reasonable for them to conclude an imminent danger existed? And, you know, again, these are one of the many reasons that we have these questions of the latitude, or maybe not the question of latitude, but just the latitude given, because we look at reasonableness. And that reasonableness is going to be based on the facts and circumstances observed. So, if MSHA wants to say that there was people working in that area and going to work in that area and that wasn't the case, or maybe they were just saying people are going to be in this area shortly or could be, we need to be able to say why that was not the case uh, in order to show that that determination by the inspector was unreasonable. <clears throat> so, you know, as we said before, that that is kind of the basis for setting up this defense. We want to look at how reasonable was it, how imminent was it given normal mining operations. Those are the elements that MSHA is going to look at. Remember that we need to be able to account for where people were and what they were doing at the point in time that MSHA issues an imminent danger order. Also remember that MSHA cannot be issuing these for conditions that existed at some point in time but do not exist anymore. And that's an important element of these. We can't base these off of elements that no longer exist. So if we are going to contest them, remember, this isn't a normal citation. We're not going to get a penalty assessed on a 107A. We're going to have to file a notice of contest with the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission within 30 days of it being issued. You want to, you know, contact an attorney, or if you're going to do it yourself, you can file the document online with them, and you just need to file something stating that you deny the imminent danger occurred, you didn't hear the date that it was issued, uh, and provide a copy of that. And you know, whatever other facts and circumstances that you want to provide denying the allegations in that citation, um, you have the right to do that. And again, that's within 30 days of issuance. Another option, and I must say that I am not a huge fan of informal contest, um, but I do think at times with 107As, informal ton contest can be a useful tool. Um, now, this is likely not going to be the case if you had a 104D issued along with that 107A, but you need to evaluate the situation because the longer 107A sits out there, the more absolute MSHA believes the facts sitting in that document are, and the more they're going to defend it. And, you know, sometimes the, the best opportunity to contest these, if you have good facts as to why this wasn't the case, and you have, you know, some concrete information as to why this was misplaced, is to file that for a request for that 10-day conference or call up the district and say, we want to talk about this 107A. Um, you know, obviously, what the 10-day informal conferences are granted at the district's discretion, so you may or may not get it. But it's, it's an opportunity to put this in front of MSHA quickly while it's still fresh. 
uh, and you can evaluate why this was or was not a hazard. Um, especially if, you know, again, we have some very concrete facts as to why this was not an imminent danger. Maybe the roof fall condition or the ground control condition was not loose at all, and we had to drill and blast to abate that 107A. Obviously, that's not an imminently dangerous situation, and instead of waiting six months to a year to get all the penalty assessments and then contest them all together, you know, that might be one where we want to sit down with MSHA and say, you gave us this a week ago. We tried to bring it down with mobile equipment. We tried to bring it down three different ways. The only way we could get it that material down was to drill and blast a wall. You know, that's something to put in front of them. Maybe that unwarrantable failure or imminent danger was not reasonable. And the inspector's belief was unreasonable. So, you know, if we are going to be contesting these, we need to evaluate it. If we're unsure of some of the conditions or we're, you know, think that there is a reasonableness to it, you know, maybe a uh, informal conference is not the best option, especially, and if we have that 104D, so our likelihood of special assessments and our likelihood of agent liability investigations even increases, you know, we may not want to sit down and create more record with MSHA. Um, but that's something that can be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. So with that, if uh, I want to thank everyone for coming on today. Uh, you know, as always, don't forget to check out the, uh, the MSHA defense report, and uh, our firm also has uh, an employer defense report and an OSHA defense report, which all contain great information uh, regarding employer liability and employer defense. Um, you know, we have two more webinars for the rest of 2017, so I hope you'll be able to join me next month for record keeping requirements and in December for miners and mine managers' rights. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, I encourage you, you know, you can type them in into the chat function or please feel free to reach out to me by phone or email um, and we can discuss anything you'd like to at that time. So, you know, with that being said, um, I appreciate everyone stopping by and uh, spending an hour this afternoon with me to talk about 107As, and I hope you'll uh, join us in the future. I will uh, be sending out a recording of this webinar along with copies of the slides in the, uh, in the next day probably. So I hope to get those out to you uh, before uh, the weekend.